where we are without them in, in really fighting for the changes that, that we're hoping to see. Um, I have the pleasure now of introducing Chris Bruntlett, our first speaker. Now, Chris is the co-founder of Motor City. He's an architectural designer and a background, and he moved to Vancouver in uh, 2007 and saw this real gap in helping to kind of market the lifestyle of cycling in our everyday lives. And so he co-founded uh, co uh, Motor City with his partner, Melissa, and there they work with writing and filmmaking and photography and giving public talks to really try, and they say, to inspire healthier, happier, and simpler forms of urban mobility. Now, please join with me in inviting Chris to the stage. He's going to talk about how to humanize a lot of these changes and how we can market active transportations to local communities. Please, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Sky, for that lovely introduction. Um, okay, let's get started. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Chris Brunlett, and I've had the privilege of living, working, and cycling in Vancouver for the past 10 years. Boom. So three and a half years ago, my partner Melissa and I started a content creation agency, which we called Medacity, that stemmed out of the bike advocacy work we were doing on our evenings and weekends. And we've been lucky enough to work with a close group of friends, many of whom you see on the stage here today, uh, sorry, on the screen, um, on a number of photography and film campaigns for public and private partners around the world. So today I'm going to share what we've learned over the years uh, in what I'm calling the eight rules of effective bike marketing, which demonstrate how thinking more critically about the imagery we use help achieve the goal of building safer streets. So Vancouver has made tremendous strides as a cycling city over the last 10 years, rolling out a AAA bike network across the downtown peninsula and into the neighborhoods around the city center. But we found ourselves frustrated with the idea that getting on the bike was an athletic pursuit. It was dangerous, it was seen as political, it was seen as complicated. And we didn't see the changing demographics of people riding on the cycle tracks represented in the imagery that was being presented by the media, by bike advocates, or by the city of Vancouver themselves. So we set about changing that, initially through passion projects on evenings and weekends, which quickly snowballed into a full-time job. So before I get started on those eight rules of bike marketing, I just want to talk a little bit about why the imagery we use is so important. Whether it's on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, illustrating an editorial or a story that we're writing, or envisioning a film campaign or a photography campaign, using the right images can build political capital. We can get the public, the press, politicians, and the business community on board, and the end goal of building safer streets is much easier with them on your side. So we hope to use images that stir their imagination and help them understand why a vibrant, livable city isn't about two fast-moving lanes of traffic and two parking spots outside their front door. Secondly, we also need to consider the role that enticing imagery can use in encouraging new users to cycling. Cities spend a great deal of political capital and actual capital on their bike infrastructure and policy, but seldom consider a marketing component to that approach. Even if it's just a small amount of their budget, studies have proved that it will be a valuable return on that investment, with the ideal scenario being that someone sees that image that you're presenting and says, hey, I can do that. You only need to delve into the comment section to realize how we've organized ourselves by mode of transportation. And that transportation tribalism has become a destructive barrier on and off the streets, despite our cities becoming more multimodal places. We hope that presenting a human face and a story to that person on a bike will hopefully shed the label of quote-unquote cyclist and humanize them to the viewer. If anything, it reminds that driver next time they encounter someone on the bike, on the road, that they're also a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, with their own goals and aspirations. <laughs> Finally, 
We hope through the imagery you use that we're normalizing the act of utility cycling. Most North Americans still see getting on a bike as a recreational pursuit that is done either for fun or for exercise. And they can't really imagine a world where one would cycle to the shop, to the grocery store, to dinner, or to take their kids to school. So we strive to make cycling in regular clothes on an upright bike, bareheaded, with a, hauling, a bag of groceries as normal as it is here, as it is elsewhere, be it Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Vancouver, or Chicago. So let's get started. Rule number one is share the stories, not the statistics. In a post-truth society, people believe what they feel to be true and not what the facts and figures actually state. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are very normal reactions to change. And bringing facts to a culture war is like bringing a spoon to a knife fight. We need to learn to set aside the graphs, charts, and statistics that we normally rely on and connect to people on a human level, explain how they'll benefit pers personally from quote-unquote controversial changes. It's imperative we tell stories, craft narratives, shape messages that appeal emotionally to our fellow citizens rather than intellectually. Rule number two, think outside the echo chamber. Both our personal and professional circles, online and in real life, have become increasingly self-reinforcing and self-congratulatory. We, um, we surround ourselves with like-minded people, and algorithms feed us news and ideas that strengthen our existing worldviews. We need to learn and to break out of these echo chambers. We need to stop preaching to the converted and think bigger and more creatively about getting outside of our existing feedback loops. This will help spread our message to a broader audience, challenge us to think differently about our problems, and take a diverse range of perspectives into consideration. Rule number three, promote the bike culture you want. So we believe that it's crucial that you're aspirational in the types of imagery that you use. Think of it as a marketing exercise rather than a documenting one. You need to represent the types of people you want to see cycling on your city streets, not the ones that are currently using them. That includes a variety of ages and abilities. We should also consider the types of bikes they're riding and the types of clothing they're wearing. And yes, it's okay to show people not wearing helmets, if, like me, that's the type of bike culture you ultimately envisage for your city. Rule number four, be the diversity you want to see. In a similar vein, it's important to show a variety of ages, abilities, ethnicities, and body types. If you can't see it, you can't be it. The worlds of cycling, transportation, and urbanism are still very pale, stale, and male, but things are slowly getting better. In the meantime, we should share the stories of often ignored people that are cycling or would like to cycle, reinforcing the idea that building safer streets levels the playing field for all users, regardless of their income or influence. Rule five, market a lifestyle, not a product. This is something the automobile industry has been doing for decades. They've been selling the ideas of joy, freedom, and unlimited mobility, even if it means lying by showing the streets unclogged with traffic. We need to use the same strategies, although I would argue that we're at least being truthful in our representations of getting on a bike. For us, that means telling compelling human stories where the bicycle plays a supporting role to that person's lifestyle. Rule six, make it look safe, simple, and sexy. Some of the biggest mental barriers around urban cycling is that it's urban warfare. It's seen as dangerous, complicated, and a little bit sweaty. We need to carefully consider whether the photo we're including in that tweet or story reinforces those misconceptions. Number seven, celebrate the success stories. The media loves the conflict, and with proposed bicycle infrastructure, it will unquestionably focus on controversy. We seldom see good news stories of new users and businesses that result from these quote-unquote controversial decisions. We need a counter-narrative that reinforces the social, environmental, and financial benefits of building bike lanes. And last but not least, show, don't tell. So allow me to stress that nobody, I mean nobody, likes to be preached to. And part of the resentment of quote-unquote cyclists is the guilt that people are made for not riding a bike. We're not going to guilt them onto their bikes, nor will we convince them via words. But if we show them a more enjoyable, efficient mode of transportation that exists, they just might try it. So I'm going to finish up by showing a short uh, trailer for a film series that we worked on. Um, there you go.
lot of life, including riding a bike or traveling or running a business is all the same. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. But no matter what, if you just get on with it, stop to smell the roses along the way, and you keep going no matter what, you will have a happy journey. So that entire film series, the Vancouver Cycle, <laughs> Vancouver Cycle Chic Films and a number of other film projects we've worked on are all available on our website. Thanks for your attention this afternoon. I hopefully, hopefully you got something out of this exercise. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I can certainly hang out in the lobby after the talk is done. Otherwise, you can contact me uh, via email or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, our website is modacitylife.com. Thank you. Great. I can't wait to check out those uh, movies and hopefully you guys can do so as well. It is so important. I think a lot of us fight every day to get projects on the ground and see the real difference uh, in the physical realm. But of course, how we talk about that and the different tools of communication are fundamental to reaching a very broad audience. And like you say, to go beyond probably many of the people in this room already converted uh, to a lot of these ideas. So thanks very much, Chris.